Hello, everyone. Hope you are doing well. Thank you to each and every of one for being here with us today. My name is Thais Italiani. I'm the Market Intelligence Manager here at Headpoint and your host for today's event. On behalf of the entire Headpoint team, I'd like to warmly welcome all participants to our first webinar of the year. In today's event, our goal is to share with you the top findings from our latest white paper that approaches the year ahead for the agriculture and energy commodity markets. Today, we'll have a team of 22 specialists from market intelligence and risk management across the globe joining us to discuss the global macro scenario and the perspectives for multiple commodities, including energy, carbon, wheat, corn, soy, cotton, sugar, and coffee. Before we kickstart today's agenda, I would like to invite Fatima. Fatima is our head of customer experience and global branding. She will share a few words with us. Please, Fatima, welcome. Thanks, Thais. And hello, everyone. Thank you for taking part in our webinar today. We are very excited to share with you our outlook for 2023 regarding the agricultural and energy commodity markets. As risk management advisors and hedging specialists, our purpose to help our clients to turn financial risks into opportunities by strategically anticipating and responding to market movements. Hedgepoint is present on five continents, and today you meet some of my colleagues based in Chicago, Sao Paulo, Rosario, Dubai, Zurich, and other places around the world. The diversity is what gives us the ability to connect the local needs of each sector to the global landscape. Our team of professionals have dedicated countless hours to gathering the material presented today. And I'm really confident that you'll be crucial is in helping you plan your 2023 hedging and risk management strategies. Thank you again for participating in our 2023 Market Outlook webinar. I will hand it back to Thais and she will introduce our first group of speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, thank you for the introduction, kind words. Uh, I'd like to notify some details for our webinar before starting. So uh, we have a live chat feature available. If you have any questions, that, just click on chat on the right-hand corner of your control panel. Our experts would be happy to clarify any questions you might have during our presentation. Also, I can ask you to share your opinion with us about this event. We have a QR code that you can scan and submit your feedback before you leave the webinar. I also want to mention that all of you that answered the survey will receive the recording of this event, so we can, can check it later. Your opinion really matters to us. Thank you once again. Okay, let's get started with our first panel of the day. We'll kick off the webinar by speaking about macroeconomic factors affecting the 2023 commodity markets. To discuss that, I'm joined today by Hector and Aleph from our market intelligence team. Hector, Aleph, welcome. Thank you both for being with me today. I'd like to begin these discussions with Hector. Uh, so, uh, hello, Thais. Thank you for your introduction. And hello, Aleph, that's also going to be joining us. Uh, he's our agriculture and macro analyst. So we're kicking off the webinar series by talking about our perspectives for the uh, macro fundamentals for the year of 2023. And uh, to start with that, I think it's fair to say that we are living a historical moment for the global economy because central banks have raised interest rates to the highest level in more than 40 years, both in developed and emerging uh, nations. And in these two locations, we're seeing unusually elevated interest rates. Uh, this high interest rate environment of tight monetary conditions has really Im negatively impacted uh, activity, especially in the uh, manufacturing side, but also in the services one. So this, a couple of factors basically explains why inflation has started to cool down um, um, uh, globally. But something that is also important to comment is the fact that because of this high interest rate uh, environment, activity levels are you know being impacted and they're likely to continue being impacted throughout 2023 so a period of low um, of low growth is expected uh, for the global economy throughout the year 
And uh, this is very different than a recession because a recession means like a, a, an, ex, an extended period of um, months with a below average growth. And that's not really the case because we're seeing, uh, even though interest rates were elevated, we're seeing, for example, uh, the labor market remaining very tight, wages not coming down at all. So I think there's a lot of factors that make us understand that we're not really, really heading potentially to a recession, but to a below average growth uh, period in 2023. For the commodity market, I think that um, the, the, the most obvious implication of this high interest rate environment is that liquidity in the financial market has vanished because central banks remained uh, with interest rates elevated. And uh, that is negative for commodities because uh, in these uh, circumstances, speculators tend to prefer less volatile assets. And commodities and emerging currencies are very volatile assets. So, uh, so this uh, liquidity challenge is going to be something to watch in 2023. So just uh, to kick off here, I'd like to ask Thais, uh, what are the uh, challenges that she thinks that commodities will face in 2023 and uh, what should we be expecting? Yeah, well, Hector, as, as you mentioned, time liquidity makes normally volatile assets look less attractive, especially when interest rates are elevated, which sends money to fixed income assets. So this is the big picture that we have so far, but emerging currencies and commodities don't fall into this group. So it's worth to mention this, that while we saw during most 2022 money flying out of commodities and emerging currencies to develop uh, countries, this is not we are planning to see this year. So apparently started to change. China's comeback to the market is being followed by increasing liquidity over there. At the same time, the West is shrinking its monetary supply, as you also highlighted. So the big outcome for us is gradual reopening is being supported and could offset any weakness seen in the West now because of, of a recession. So uh, this is my, my point when the topic comes to the, the picture for 2023. Well, I think that you know China's re reopening very quickly, and uh, the uh, lifting of containment measures happened happened way faster than many uh, market participants were expecting. So, this was suddenly a bullish fundamental for the commodity market that will obviously uh, kind of offset or has the potential to at least partially offset the weakness in the West. Because as I mentioned, we're likely to see a below average growth in 2023, like in Europe specifically and perhaps even in the United States. But seeing China come back to the market is very positive because depending on how strong this comeback is, we could more than offset any demand weakness that in the West, which would basically uh, prevent uh, commodity demand from falling. Um, we're seeing very positive indicators that China is coming back to the market. For example, refinery utilization levels are going up uh, very substantially. Steel making plants are also running at elevated uh, utilization rates. So there are indications that China is back to the market. Mobility indicators, people uh, using uh, public transportation, traffic jams are, are back uh, in, in the Chinese uh, cities. Um, but the key point here is the fact that China being back to the market is a very positive fundamental for commodity exporting countries, which normally happen to be uh, emerging nations as well. So, for example, uh, Brazil shares a very significant uh, trade ties with China. So... Uh, especially through the grain market and also iron ore markets, Chile, Colombia, and several other uh, Eastern Asian uh, countries. They all have like, they are all like commodity exporting countries to China. So China demanding their assets is a very positive thing because it strengthens their currencies through trade, uh, trade balances and their four terms of trade. Um, and uh, something that I'd like to mention is the fact that Financial markets understand this. It's like this is not like a, not a mainstream deal. This is actually what speculators are betting. So we're seeing, for example, speculative net length in uh, in the Mexican peso in Brazil and Brazilian real, for example, coming back to positive values, indicating that uh, financial markets are anticipating Brazilian real, Mexican peso to strengthen over the dollar. So, and in my opinion, this is something that makes sense to expect because. If you consider the fact that China is coming back uh, to the market and also that uh, developed central banks are likely to stop rising interest rates, then there's really the potential to that uh, emerging assets will shine. So um, so I'd like just uh, to ask Thais and Aleph, you can join uh, after her. Um, what's your take for emerging currencies in 2023? What should we be uh, looking at? And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's her. And it's also worth to mention that commodity exporting countries, as you highlighted, are typically emerging nations. So 
uh, in these regions, the interest rates usually remain elevated because of fiscal issues and political risk. So this risk premium usually attracts money through carry trade, whose flows get even larger in moments when commodity prices go up. So with the developed countries' interest rates close to their top, there will be a lot of attention being paid for emerging countries' effects. That's why speculative positioning in Brazil Health, for example, is strengthened so much recently. Yeah, uh, yeah, indeed, this is a very positive scenario for emerging currencies and also commodities. I guess, as you guys mentioned, China reopening is one of the, the main factors that is it uh, increases demand for commodities. And uh, as Aitor mentioned, usually emerging markets are exporters of commodities. But I guess the main point for this is strength of emerging uh, currencies and, and markets is the, the Fed's policy as also it threw a little bit in pointed on, on that during his his talks. I guess one of the main uh, fundamentals uh, behind the, the strength of emerging markets currencies is that the Fed will likely end its uh, monetary tightening cycle and it, it can even start cut, cutting rates by the end of the year. So this is something that we got to uh, take a, a closer look at. And I'd like to ask uh, uh, Thais and also Eitor can join the conversation on what are your views for the Fed's uh, monetary policy during uh, 2023? Right, Halef. So US CPI has shown solid signs of a sustainable downward path in the last few months. We are seeing this. So we are very likely near the end of the current tightening cycle. It's, it's important to highlight this. So even if rates reach a peak in the US, the Fed can still bring some volatility to commodities and FX markets should it postpone rates cuts for to 2024, which so is not a likely scenario so far. Um, so I think that, in, in my opinion, inflationary forces haven't really gone away. So it wouldn't be a surprise, for example, to see some uh, some uh, indexes of inflation uh, this year starting to go up in the developed nation, uh, in, in developed nations. Especially if you consider the fact that uh, fuel prices do have the potential to go up with the uh, with the Russian embargo on diesel and gasoline. Uh, coming around, um, and uh, this is not to mention that the labor market remains very tight. So uh, participation rate among top economies is low, so people aren't a actively looking for a job the way they used to before the pandemic, but demand for labor is elevated. So supply and demand tells us that uh, wages have to go up, and wage inflation is a very important part of inflation. So should this inflationary comeback, or at least a softened version of it, appear in 2023, I wouldn't be very much optimistic about the fact that um, this rate cut uh, debate will start getting strong. Actually, I think that we're likely to have 2023 with a uh, very, um, with you know, tight monetary conditions, and uh, this high interest rate environment is likely to um, to uh, continue around for for 2023. Um, however, uh, as we're seeing, markets market participants are convinced that uh, this view is not like mainstream. So. Uh, inflation is expected to continue on a downward path to, throughout 2023. And um, again, this combined with the fact that uh, um, China is demanding more commodities, commodity prices are going up. I think that this uh, macro setup is more than enough to keep uh, uh, emerging currencies attractive for speculators, uh, especially international investors. So uh, I think that, you know, should we don't have any... Uh, Inflationary surprise in 2023. I think that emerging currencies are very well positioned to uh, benefit from this, uh, uh, from at least the end of the monetary uh, tightening cycle. Yeah, indeed, it uh, I guess, as usual, when we talk about the macro environment, we gotta take a look, a very close look to what the Fed is going to to do. And I think in 2023, it's even more important, as you mentioned. Uh, I guess maybe markets are too. Optimistic, optimistic regarding uh, when uh, the Fed is going to start cutting rates, but I, I totally agree, agree with you that uh, if at least they stop uh, uh, hiking rates in 2023, that should be enough to keep this positive view for emerging uh, currencies and also for commodities. And that leads this uh, macro setup usually leads to a, a weak uh, dollar index, and that also as uh, the euro is the the main component of the 
dollar index is also set for uh, a good scenario as as the market has this uh, uh, view that the Fed's going to stop hiking rates and uh, inflation in Europe is a bit uh, stronger than it is in the state. So the market has the view that the ECB, that is the Europe's central bank, is going to be a little a little more hawkish than the Fed. It's it, it this is setting the euro to strength uh, against the the dollar, and that's what we are seeing in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, and we are also seeing uh, speculators increasing a lot their uh, their long positions in the in the euro against uh, the dollar, but. Uh, maybe like uh, people are seeing this positive scenario for them, the the European currency, but we also gotta take uh, a closer look to some risks that we see to to the scenario because if this uh, upward trend that we are seeing for the euro reverts, we may have like uh, a stronger dollar index and that can also lead to to some impacts in commodities and also on only measuring currencies and i guess like we have like two main risks regarding the scenario for the for the european market in the european economy in 2023 one is that uh the the economy in the european uh the european bloc it's becoming kind of a less competitive due to the higher energy costs that they're seeing given the the conflict scenario and like the the, the lack of uh, Russian uh, refined products, which is leading, leading to higher energy costs. And that's leading to uh, a less competitive uh, competitiveness of the industries in, in Europe. And that is leading to record high uh, trade deficits in, in Europe, which tends to make uh, a currency weaker. So if we keep seeing this trend, maybe, maybe that can uh, remove some of, the, some of the bullishness we're seeing uh, with the euro and also as i mentioned before like we're seeing uh the long positions in the euro in the euro like increasing a lot and maybe like if we have like uh if we keep seeing this large trade deficits and maybe like an, an inflation uptick again in the us and maybe a, a little change in the fed's monetary policy this upper trend that we're seeing for the euro it may revert and then lead to a weaker a weaker euro so i guess we got we gotta keep a, a, a close look at this situation of course um uh so far we're seeing a good scenario for for the the euro and a weak scenario for the dxy but we gotta uh take a look at this these risks during 2023 and i'd like to ask you later if you have anything to try or any comments on on that Okay, so uh, I think Aleph, as you mentioned, um, the, the major risk for the European economy is like the industrialization of certain parts of the economy, especially the petrochemical one. So, and Europe has got uh, used to have like a very strong petrochemical sector, which would normally help the trade balance remain uh, positive. But the thing is, uh, financial markets are too optimistic about the euro, so we're seeing um, leverage funds uh, buying a lot of uh, euros uh, futures and options, getting along in euros futures and options against the dollar. So the, in my opinion, one of the risks that should not be uh, uh, forgotten is the fact that when we have like a crowded trade, when there's like a, a lot of investors thinking the same thing and doing the same thing, then there's um, the potential that any sudden change in fundamentals could lead to a major uh, position unwind. So with, with that in mind, I think that uh, additional euro volatility shouldn't be, uh, yeah, should be expected, especially if investors kind of revisit their uh, their um, optimistic view towards the euro, um, as well as for emerging currencies too. So, but just like to conclude here, I think that, uh, especially talking about emerging currencies now, um, one thing that we should not also forget, apart from all these usual macro fundamentals that will look like, for example, interest rates in the United States, what the Fed will do, and how trade balances in Europe are going to look like, I think that um, emerging currencies have the potential to benefit from this uh, geopolitic, uh, from geopolitics, basically, because um, we're seeing a lot of companies trying to reshore uh, or relocate their operations away from China and uh, put like their plants uh, near consuming hubs. So Mexico, for example, is being uh, benefited for that. We're seeing, uh, for example, a lot of um, foreign direct uh, 
investment being um, anticipated to reach Mexico because of this. And, um, you know, countries in Southeast Asia are also likely to benefit from this. So Brazil uh, can also have like a potential because Brazil has a, a very um, green energy mix. So companies that are looking to relocate from China and also benefit from green energy could uh, see Brazil as, a, as, a, as an opportunity. But, um, but yeah, I think that generally speaking, um, emerging currencies have this positive view, uh, have this positive outlook for 2023 that, um, that obviously, you know, need to be uh, closely watched because uh, after all these three years, anything can happen. But uh, as of now, uh, we remain very positive about commodities and emerging currencies in 2022. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. That was very insightful. So in summary, as Aleph highlighted, the inter highlighted, we are seeing a very positive picture for commodities in 2023, also for emerging currency. Looking from a macro perspective, with China's reopening and the end of Fed tightening cycle, so it's worth to mention that the main risk for this scenario is, of course, another inflation uptick, so uh, which can change the directions of Fed monetary policy. And once again, thank you for the great discussions. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Alex. And now we are moving on to our next segment, Energy Commodity Markets. I'd like to invite Heitor once again for our market intelligence team. Welcome, Heitor. Also, Austin, our head of energy risk management for Americas, speaking from Chicago. And Matthew, our head of risk management in the Asia Pacific region based in Singapore. Welcome, everyone, and have a great discussion. So uh, thank you, Thais. Uh, hello, everybody. Hey, Matt. Hey, Austin. Um, so um, thank you, Thais, for your introduction. And um, we'll talk about the trending topics of the energy market and uh, what 2023 may hold for us uh, after a very exciting and volatile 2022. Uh, Matt, Matt and Austin, I'll be asking you guys some questions, but feel free to interrupt each other as we're in a roundtable. Okay. Um, well, as I said, 2022 was a very volatile year in terms of prices, and uh, I don't think that 2023 could be any different. Uh, the war in Ukraine is still happening. China's coming back to the market very rapidly uh, after, you know, some years under those extremely harsh uh, containment measures. Um, and now a period of uh, below average growth in the West is likely to, to be witnessed. So with all these topics, I'd like to ask Austin, uh, what energy commodities should we pay attention uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, likely a recession or at least a global slowdown? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I think in general, uh, you know, when you look at the manufacturing sector, which kind of leads recessionary, um, you know, periods, diesel is kind of the, the major uh, the major refined product to pay attention to. So, um, you know, if, if consumption and personal spending is still high and the, the actual wallet share of, a, of an individual is doing okay, but the economy on a manufacturing level is, is falling apart, then gasoline might remain supported and diesel could, uh, could drop. Um, that's kind of the opposite effect that we've seen, um, you know, versus last year where diesel has really outperformed the broader refined product basket. Um, one other commodity I think is really important to pay attention to in a recession is, you know, as personal consumption drops and people spend less money, um, you know, they're going to travel less. They're going to go on planes less. So both gasoline and jet uh, can can ultimately be impacted by that. So those are kind of the, uh, I'd say, the main ones to keep an eye on. Oh, good. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. So, um, well, I think that the, what I'd like to bring here is that, you know, diesel inventories have been really rising recently, even though, like, they remain uh, below their average, their seasonal averages uh, in pretty much um, all regions. But, uh, you know, that period of substantial shortage that we had throughout 2022 may be gone now as China is exporting a lot more products than it uh, normally does. Um, and on top of that, what also helped diesel prices fall globally recently is the fact that uh, temperatures have been way warmer than, than the average in Europe, meaning that all the natural gas supplies that they originally secured were more than enough for them to uh, go through, through the winter. Um, so getting back to the uh, Chinese flow debate, uh, I'd like to ask Matt uh, what, his, what his view on, um, on how the Chinese exports are going to look like. If you think also, Matt, that uh, the uh, Chinese reopening could, you know, uh, leave less products to be exported abroad. Yeah, thanks, Autor. Yeah, Chinese, the reopening was, was faster than what many expected. And with traffic and public transportation usage rapidly rising, and don't forget about the lockdowns, which were recently lifted after being heavily locked down uh, as recently as like November. 
So an indication of this comeback is the increase of refinery, refinery utilization levels, both in private and state-owned refineries. What's giving them this push is not only a stronger domestic mar uh, uh, market, but also the possibility of exporting their products. Beijing announced sizable fuel export quotas, and that made China start exporting more fuel to Europe, helping the region to offset the loss of the Russian supplies. This is one of the greatest weaknesses uh, in the refined products markets. Chinese supplies are rising very rapidly, up to 1.12 million barrels per day of refining capacity is expected to be added into China. However, there is a possibility that gas, gasoline and, and diesel demand will rise domestically in China, which will leave less products be available, be available to be exported. So that's bullish for products and differentials in Asia. As inventories, especially if diesel remains significantly below the seasonal average. And the embargo on Russia diesel will be important to closely watch to see if the supplies will be disrupted or not. Um, well, so China is going to be uh, interesting to follow in 2023. Uh, as we know, they've adopted expansionary fiscal policies recently to sustain the reopening. So this means that at the same time, the West is drying liquidity with central banks uh, remaining with interest rates at you know historically elevated levels. Uh, China is increasing like money supply. So at the same time, the West is going through a liquidity shortage. China is, is supporting its reopening by providing uh, cheap money. So that's quite an interesting uh, setup because depending on how strong the Western slowdown is because of this high interest rate environment, China has been back to the market with such, uh, with such expansionary fiscal and monetary policies could more than offset any demand destruction in the West. Um, so I think that uh, just uh, talking a little bit about gas now, China is also to be, uh, used to be the largest LNG importer uh, before lockdowns. So it would, it would roughly import uh, pretty much the daily, the equivalent of the daily um, dry gas output from the United States. So this is a quite significant uh, demand. And uh, seeing China back to the market is just uh, very much bullish for the natural gas market. So, so just uh, I'd like to ask um, Austin now what his uh, views on the greatest uncertainty when it comes to natural gas and LNG markets in 2023. Yeah, thanks, Ader. Um yeah, I mean, I think uh, nat gas has been, you know, all eyes have been on crude and refined products, but in reality, nat gas has actually been one of the, the most volatile products in 2022. Um, we've dropped really just in the last month, we've dropped 55% in Henry Hub nat gas prices. Um, so as we look at, you know, like you said, China being a big intaker of, uh, of LNG, ultimately we need the LNG export capacity to be able to do that. So what I think is the you know, what we think is the biggest um, kind of canary in the coal mine is the uh, the Freeport LNG terminal. Um, it's been down since, I believe, June, and it's continued to kind of roll back their restart date. Um, every month, they, you know, they delay it another month. And every time it gets delayed, combined with the warm weather that we've been seeing, it's really just caused prices to collapse. So as we move into uh, Q1, Q2 here, um, you know, the restart timing of Freeport LNG terminal is going to be pretty crucial to uh, to see the net gas market become supported. Well, um, yeah, I think I think that it all depends on the water, to be honest. So like uh, seeing Europe and the United States having uh, recently like mild winters basically uh, explains why prices have uh, fallen so much. So um, natural gas inventories are above averages pretty much like in the United States and also in Europe. And uh, that has uh, also helped prices come down. I think that's very good news for farmers that typically use nitrogen based fertilizers like ammonia and, uh, and uh, urea for their crops as they're all produced from natural gas and natural gas represents up to 95% of the production costs of these, uh, these fertilizers. So should gas prices remain low, then output costs will be consequently lower. But the problem with natural gas is that its prices are extremely volatile. Uh, at the same time, they can suddenly uh, go down like by 50% in, in some months. It can, it, it can rally again by a substantial amount. Um, so, yeah, so I think that apart from this volatility that goes from uh, oil to natural gas, I'd like to ask uh, Matt and Austin, if you want to compliment later, um, what do you think that's going to be the greatest challenges of the oil markets in 2023 uh, and also for natural gas? Well, in my view, this market has a lot of challenges, but one of the most important ones is, is the, the exploration and production side needs more capital expenditure, needs more capex. 
uh, interest rates are going to remain high, elevated in, in, in 2023, meaning that the cost of funding will also be will remain elevated. Dis you know, disincentivizing producers to really increase the capex, the investments that they need. So, because of this already low capex issue that has been around since you know 2014, to be honest, it won't be really resolved. Also, constantly changing supply and demand fundamentals, preventing from planning their output ahead. Well, um, yeah, I think that convincing producers to increase production now is pretty much difficult as on top of like high interest rate environment, there's also like volatile geopolitics, environmental uncertainty and shareholder pressure for better financial results, which are typically achieved when there's like high free cash flow generation that is usually enriched at the cost of uh, capex uh, spending or investments. So perhaps an environment of oil supplies, uh, so perhaps like an environment of where oil supplies find it hard to increase could be the new normal for this market. And depending on how demand in the future looks like, uh, periods of shortages caused by supply shocks could happen again. So in that sense, I'd like to ask uh, Austin and Matt, feel free to also uh, compliment afterwards. Uh, why managing risk is so important for the energy market, especially amid these uncertain and volatile times? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think I think in our business, you know, we're we're ultimately hedge point is a risk management service provider. So, you know, all of our customers are you know in the business of of hedging off their commodity price risk. And what we always tell everyone is, you know, at the end of the day, no one knows if the price is going to go up or down. Um, you know, it's it's going to be volatile, and the only way to kind of ensure a stable cash flow and a stable, um, you know, fixed cost or fixed revenue stream, um, and kind of you know fix that margin in your business is to to hedge. Um, you know, I think we get a lot of a, a lot of times. Like a great example is, um, you know, in 2022, oil prices went up to $150 a barrel, and a lot of people were actually hesitant to hedge on the production side um, because they thought it was going to continue to keep going higher. And so there there tends to be this kind of um, sometimes picking picking bottoms, picking tops, um, and if you know if you have a constant hedge program where you're not really um, you're taking the guesswork out of it and you're kind of remaining stable every single month with you know a fixed hedge program, I think that's the most important thing to do to kind of stabilize your business and your uh, your margin. Yeah, I, I would agree with Austin there. I mean, at the end of the day, risk management is a forecasting tool. It forecasts its future cash flow. And it doesn't matter what part of the supply chain you are, whether if it's from the producer, the production side, or on the refining side, or on the consumer side, you know, employing a risk management and hedging strategy will allow some visibility into your future cash flows and also gives the ability to control, control, let's say, fiscal year 2023 budgets. So these tools are very important for corporates all along the supply chain to use to have that visibility and more certainty as they go through 2023. Well, um, so I think that volatility is likely to be present in the oil markets in 2023. Um, and I think that pretty much uh, everyone uh, agrees with me on this topic. Um, so in the end, oil prices and refined product uh, ones will see, you know, th their price has been divided into demand concerns uh, because of rising interest rates uh, and their impacts on activity. At the same time on supply restrictions, because um, We've not talked about OPEC, for example, here, but the group has been producing oil below their monthly targets and numbers that could potentially increase their oil production aren't really willing to do that. Uh, so in the end, price driver will be the strength of the Chinese comeback. If it's super strong and well supported by the government with you know, loose monetary and fiscal policies, then it could uh, potentially offset the weakness in the West, especially in the demand side. So there were topics. Uh, so you know, these were the topics uh, we wanted to cover uh, today. But there's a lot of more of them in our white paper. So feel free to to check it uh, later. And uh, I'd like to pass it back to Thais so that she can conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hector. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Matthew. I appreciate the insightful information you brought to us today. Uh, as you highlighted, as all you just mentioned, Bullock is likely to be the key team around it. So that's why managing risks are so important for those in the energy industry, especially uh, for, for, for this environment. Count on us to, to keep you updated on this market and see you soon in the next video. OK, 
Okay, let's jump to the our carbon market discussion right now. In this segment, our expert Yuri from Market Intelligence team will join our risk management specialists to focus on the state of the carbon market. Welcome, Yuri. Thank Before you, Thais. Welcome. Before I get started, I'd like just to remind our viewers about our live chat feature. So our market intelligence experts are available right now to answer any questions you may have. Please feel free to submit your questions. So, Yuri, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Thais. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this webinar and also to count on the expertise uh, of the, our, our participants here today on CPUs and rings markets. Uh, our first speaker for the day is our uh, Energy Risk Management uh, for Americas, Austin Haggerty. Hey, how's it going, Yuri? Thank hey, you Austin. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks. Uh, so our, uh, my first question, Austin, is related to EPA's uh, proposed annual targets uh, for the 2023-2025 period that were announced last December. Uh, this January, the agency uh, had a public hearing on the matter, and the final values are, are to be set only by June. Uh, do you think we should expect some price volatility uh, in the first half of 2023? And how could uh, risk management help in this scenario? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I, I, I think volatility in all of the commodity markets has been pretty apparent. Um, and, you know, RINs and the LCFS and kind of the environmental credit markets are no exception to that rule. Um, really, the the big thing around RINs is that it's all regulatory driven um, and a lot of it can be very binary. So, you know, we anticipate these events like in June or back in December when they announced the preliminary RVO numbers and you get these massive uh, volatile events in, in the price of RINs. Um, so definitely expect to continue to see RINs volatility. Uh, especially leading up to this announcement, there's going to be people that will uh, essentially pre-trade what they believe will be the expectation. Um, and a lot of times you kind of see, you know, expectations change as we lead into that event. So, um, you know, in terms of what we can offer to help manage some of that risk and that price volatility, um, you know, we're going to be offering, Hedge Point's going to be offering, um, you know, swaps on RINs in 2023, which will allow people to be able to kind of have a lower barriers to entry to get into risk management. Um, because as of right now, you got to have to register with the EPA, you know, uh, cover yourself from a compliance perspective and an auditing perspective. Whereas when you use Hedgepoint for just the swaps market, you know, it's not, you don't necessarily have to be an obligated party to participate. You can get your price exposure hedged, uh, you know, without the physical element of registering with the EPA. So um, yeah, that's, that's really it from my side. Yeah, that's uh, totally agree with you, Austin. Uh, volatility has been present, uh, uh, really present since last year. Uh, another topic what brought to discussion by EPA is the uh, inclusion of a pathway for electric vehicles to generate the so-called e-rings. Uh, in this pathway, rings would be created once an EV is charged with electricity generated by biofuels. Uh, if this pathway is indeed approved, uh, we are going to see a rise in the supply of rings. Um, do you think that it would be beneficial for the market to have uh, an additional source of rings and also to include new players in this market? Sorry, my mic was uh, was not working, but uh, yeah, I think anytime there's a new player, it depends on who who which side of the aisle you're on. Um, you know, it's beneficial for the producers of those of biogas, for example, and you know the people that are going to benefit from the ERINs. Same thing if if we introduced uh, SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, the airlines would be able to participate in those those government credits. So the people that are kind of in that new pathway are the ones that win. The people that lose though are the ones that have kind of built a business on the existing margins of the other RINs that were already in play. Um, anytime there's a new kind of supply to the market, then of course we're gonna see prices discount uh, because in the example of what you provided, the E-RINs, you know, if you produce a, a renewable power from biogas, you produce this, this D3 RIN. And previously D3 RIN would be from things like 
uh, cellulosic material like wood chips and wood residue uh, that produce renewable diesel. And now we're introducing this different pathway that can bring volume into the D3 market. And so anytime that happens, the price is going to discount substantially, which is going to hurt the margins of existing players in that space. Um, I think a good a good chart to look at is, you know, the D3 RIN back in January uh, of this year in December of last year dropped from close to three dollars a gallon down to two fifteen a gallon. So we've lost 25, 30 percent of the value of D3 RINs ever since the inclusion announcement of um, of e RINs. So it's definitely, uh, you know, it can move markets quite a bit. Certainly. Uh, last year, both free market and Sibiu market uh, took a hit following government announcements. So uh, in the US, as we know, the, the trigger was EPA's release of the proposed target for 23-25 period. And in Brazil, the, uh, the, the, the trigger was mainly due to the postponement of the date to prove compliance with the annual target. Do you think that in this scenario, the introduction of financial markets could be beneficial for RINs? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, ICE, ICE uh, Exchange has kind of launched RINs over the last, I think really the last five years, but until the last year or two, it hadn't really taken off. Um, I think the introduction of a futures market is good for price discovery, and it's also good for liquidity because it brings additional players into the market, um, kind of back to the first question that might have had a bit of a higher barriers to entry to enter that market um you know registering with the epa going through the compliance with the government agency it's not an easy process to get involved and so for participants that can now just trade through a clearinghouse or through you know an otc desk like ourselves um, i think that's very beneficial for uh both price discovery liquidity uh but also reduces volatility um the other element of that is it allows people to kind of hedge further down the curve um, you know, in the physical markets of RINs, you can't really get deferred RINs markets to, to hedge out future production that easily. Um, you know, you have to find the other side to that. Whereas in the futures market, there's liquid RINs curves for three, four years down the, uh, down the stretch. So, you know, it definitely is a, a beneficial thing. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how Brazil kind of follows suit. Thank you, Austin. It was a pleasure having you here today. Yeah, thank you. Now we'll discuss the development of the Sibius market with our Central America Risk Management Expert from Sugar Americas, Gabriel Oliveira. Hi, Hi Gabriel. It's great to be here. Thanks, Gabriel. It's great having mm -hmm. you here, too. Uh, so, Gabriel, uh, our futures market for Sibius is something that has been made much waited for. And last December, the issue, issuance of ordinance number 56 by the Ministry of Mines and Energy created a path for this market. How do you think this change will help the program in terms of maturity and also in terms of possibilities it can bring for uh, risk management? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. And I think that what Austin was just talking about right now applies perfectly to, to Sibios as well. Because, well, a futures market of Sibius would enable a better view of supply and demand for Sibius and, and thus more possibilities for risk management, both for obligated and non-obligated parties in the market of Sibius, right? And would as well bring more speculative players and thus more liquidity. So I think it would be very beneficial for, for the market. However, it is not clear how they're, how they're going to structure that. Yeah, that's that's correct. It's something to watch this year. Uh, so uh, after the postponement of the dates to prove compliance with annual targets and also the revision of 2023's targets down, uh, Sibio market has seen quite quite a lot of change in the in recent months. Uh, what what's your view for Sibio market this year? Yeah, I think it's a great great question because that's what everyone's trying to figure out right now, right? So basically, I'm, I'm quite bullish for Sibius this year. Um, I especially believe for in, in Q3, we're going to have a ramp up of prices because it's when the obligated parties have to retire their credits and they have to, to comply with the, with the goal. So I think that in Q3, we should have prices, uh, we could have prices going up. 
But in, we have to take in consideration the entire situation of Brazilian fuel policy and fuel price policy for this year. And in general, we have some uncertainties, right? Um, we should have gasoline prices subsidized, and that could mean less competitiveness for, for ethanol and thus uh, more consumption of gasoline. And having that in mind, what sugar millers should be doing uh, is basically switching their mix from uh, to, towards a max sugar mix instead of ethanol max uh, production. And that would mean less issuance of Sibius. So we would have less Sibius being issued. And in addition to that, we could have more consumption of, of gasoline. And, and that would mean higher needs for offsets in the next year. And with that in mind, the market could anticipate that movement and speculators, speculative players could um, buy Sibius right now, but, I mean, this year, so they could offset in the next year. So they could, they, this could even uh, increase the pressure and in um, and the, and, and the upside of the prices this year for Sibius. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with her, with us today. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks uh, for sticking with us while we discuss carbon markets. It's been a pleasure having you here with us. But now your journey continues with Thais. Thank you, Yuri. I appreciate the insightful information that you brought up to us today. So as they highlighted some point that we need to pay attention to in carbon during 2023 is the API's final RVO mandate to be released in June, the inclusion of a pathway for E-rings and the development of the CBU markets here in Brazil, futures markets. So once again, thank you for the insightful information, guys. And I'd like to remind you watching us here that if you'd like to receive the videos, the recordings to check it later, please check our QR code on the screen and respond to our survey. I hope you all are enjoying our 2023 Outlook webinar. Up next, we have our segment on sugar. I'd like to introduce Livia, our market intelligence coordinator, and our risk management experts that are joining her today. who we'll have Murilo, the head of Sugar Americans, speaking from our office in Sao Paulo. Vipu, based in Dubai and part of our EMEA team. Matheus and Gabriel from our Sugar Americas group. So, hello everyone. Thanks for being here. Welcome, Livia. Thanks, Feel Thais. Free. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Thank sharing you, the room with so many experts and talking about the sugar market. For sure, it will be amazing. Feel free to, to lead the way. So, as Thais said, now we're going to go through a tour on the sugar market. And it's with great pleasure that I invite our risk management expert, Vidu Bandari, to talk about the hottest topics in Asia and Europe. Hi, people. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hey, Livia. It's my pleasure as well. <laughs> so uh, to start this conversation, we've been hearing a lot about India on the news. It's made out the highlight over the past few months. And a lot of concerns have been rising about its sugar availability, especially for exports. So how much do you think and how much do you expect India to contribute to global trade flows? Sure thing. So India has always been a surprise pack, surprise deck in the pack, and it will continue to be so because the production numbers, they vary a lot and as of now, the consensus is between 34.3 to 36.5 million metric ton. And given that the country has already allowed exports of 6 million metric ton and a consumption of, say, 28 to 29 million metric ton. So if we just sum both of them, it comes out to 34 million metric ton. So if that is what is being produced and exported, then we'll have to have a look at the closing stock or the beginning stock for 2022 season, right? So if you look at them, then it becomes like very tight situation. But then our numbers are around like 35.5. And if we believe that the consumption is going to be staying at 28, a million metric ton may come out, but that is highly unlikely. Given that 2024 is an election year, so domestic prices will have to be kept in mind as well. So unlikely that there would be any further announcements for export from India. 
So for India, we need to watch out production yields to get a better picture of how much they will have of variability to understand if, in fact, there could be another quota uh, announcement anytime soon. Okay, so by now, our estimate is that it's rather difficult to have any additional quota. Uh, when we go to Thailand on Asia side still, uh, we've been hearing a lot about the change from fresh to burnt cane. Uh, could this change affect yields yet this season? Yes, so Thailand is also like a tricky one because it might be changing the scenario totally. If we take the cue from Brazil since 2007 till 2013, when the green harvesting was started in Brazil, the yield had reduced or dropped from 85 tons per hectare to 79 tons per hectare. Right? That's a significant decrease in the yields. So if we see those numbers coming up for Thailand, and that would be reducing the availability of sugar from that part of the world as well. So Thailand, of course, for this year, we have the numbers which are in almost like 11.5 million metric ton. But going forward, we will have to see how the yields are reacting to the new mechanism. Okay, so it's a long-term trend that we need to monitor, right? Right. So Vipo, now going to the other region, Europe, uh, we've seen that last year with the Russian-Ukraine conflict, we had a bunch of trouble, especially regarding costs of production, uh, refining costs and etc. cetera. Uh, but we also expect a crop break for this season. So how do you see this crop break affecting global dynamic? Okay, so for the Europe region, the crop break has been there, no doubt. And generally, its impacts on the export and imports, so higher demand for imports and a restriction on the exports which can come out from the region, right? So, as you rightly said, the cost has been very volatile and the cost of production is higher and the domestic prices are also higher. So, that way, it is trying to balance it out. During the starting of the season, we had many doubts whether many of the refineries would operate or they would not operate at all because of the given of the not just the prices, but the availability of the resources to start with, right? So that way it becomes a little bit more tricky. But yes, for the overall SND for the world market, not much of a give and take from that region. Like a million metric ton, which is expected, that should be there and should not be impacting the other SND for the overall world market. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. Nice to hear. So. Uh, a lot of things to watch out on the regions, both Europe and Asia. Thanks for your insights. They were very helpful, Vipo. And it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much, Livia. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. And now we jump to the other side of the world with our Central America risk management expert, Gabriel Oliveira. Hi, Livia. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you. Uh, so a lot has been discussed about Northern Hemisphere crop lateness, but little has been talked about the situation in North and Central America. Can you enlighten us with a bit of what's going on there? Yes, absolutely. I think we could break into parts. So if we start talk, talking about uh, the U.S. and Mexico, both countries are expected to produce a little bit less and mostly due to weather conditions, right? We had different situations, different weather conditions in both but overall, we had a production which was should be slightly lower in those two countries. And if we go to Central America, we, we talk about Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, right? These countries should also produce a little bit less. And then and that's also related to weather. Okay. So if, and if, if we combine this main countries, main producing countries in the region, so if we take if we take US, Mexico, Nicaragua, Guatemala, and El Salvador we should have a 1.5 reduction in production. Oh, okay. Okay. Which and all, be, yeah, please. All that is due to weather then, uh, the, the main reason is weather. Uh, could, could you explain a little bit better what are the conditions that led to this, uh, to this loss in volume? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so let's start with the US, right? In the United States, we have basically drier and warmer weather, uh, which affected sugar beet in the north and that reduced sugar beet uh, yields in the US. And in the south was, well, in the south we have kind of a, a, a situation that offsets that situation in the north because we had more rains, which helped uh, in terms of productivity and yields of, of sugar cane in the south. 
So we have kind of a offset situation in the US. In Mexico, we had dry weather. Even though we had a bigger harvested area, we had dry weather, lower yields, so lower production and lower output from Mexico. Right. And going down, uh, down south to Central America, uh, Guatemala and El Salvador and Nicaragua, all these countries were under a certain influence of La Nina, La Nina effect, right? So what happens when we have a strong La Nina or a moderate La Nina, which we had, we usually have more rains in that region and that excessive rains uh, uh, is load the, the harvest procedure. And as well as we had lower luminosity. So with lower light, lower luminosity, we expect lower yields and lower sugar content. And that's what we're seeing right now. So for the, for, for, for this for these countries, if we take all of them together, we expect a 1.5 production, which which should give us a total output of 18.2 million metric tons of the, okay. for the region. So 1.2% reduction, right? Uh, so the, um, I see that we're reducing compared to the previous crop. So how does this reduction affect global trade flows? Yeah, yeah, that's going to affect global trade flows, not in a big scale, because what usually happens is as Mexico is going to produce less, uh, what's likely to happen is that the U.S. is going to import more sugar from countries such as Guatemala. And that means less sugar to the global trade flow, right? So we're going to the U.S. and not going to the to the global market uh, in general. But uh, the situation is basically uh, we have a, in the region we have a two millimetric uh, two millimetric tons uh, surplus, and that means that these two millimetric tons could go to the trade flows in the net, in the global market, right? Right. And that's probably probably Vipu mentioned about that. But what's going to happen is that sugar is going to, to, to have good pricing conditions, good price in the market because of lack of uh, not so much availability of sugar uh, from Asia. So this could supply and uh, replace some of the sugar that's not coming out of India or Thailand. Okay, so the drop in Central America is not going to be sufficient to make them not have a great participation on sugar trade flows. They're going to still be part of it and probably going to offset a little bit what's going on on the Asia side. So yeah, this is this insight's extremely important, extremely helpful. So thanks, Gabriel, for being here with us today. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Lydia. Moving to the main sugar supplier, Brazil, we count on the participation of a risk management expert, Matheus Jacques. Hi, Matheus. It's a pleasure to have you here and count on your expertise. Hey, Livia. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. So we know that Brazil has been to a crop break, to a partial recovery, and is bound to, well, partially recovery in this 22-23 crop season. But what can we expect for the coming one, the 23-24 year? Uh, well, weather has been very positive here in Brazil lately. Uh, we have seen many regions showing up improvement on their crops. And forecasts, Livia, are saying that rain should keep the space until the new crop starts. So, yes. Uh, we, can, we can expect a recovery in 23-24. Uh, and Livia, I would like to add that uh, currently for the 23-24 crop, we estimate 595 million tons of sugar cane. But keep in mind uh, that the range goes from 580 to 600 million tons. And it all depends on weather diversity. Oh, okay. So weather is the, best, the big risk here, right? But uh, when we talk about sugar production, actually, we also always talk about sugar mix. So how do you see uh, this percentage being and how do you see this behavior in sugar mills decision this next crop? Yeah. OK, uh, this is a tricky question, Livia, uh, because of the many political factors that impacts on the answer. But considering all the information we have right now and today, yes. Ethanol has failed to fight sugar for TRS ever since their prices lost competitiveness in the Brazilian fuel market, given the tax regime changes. Uh, but for now, recent Brazilian statements make us believe in another max sugar year, even with a surplus in the sweetener global market. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, we believe in a max sugar, we believe in a recovery. What are the main risks we have on this view? 
Uh, okay, uh, the main risk, uh, we have two risks, right? Uh, I'll start from the first one. The main risk to this vision is a surprise in the government's position regarding the ethanol sector. If it ends up deciding in favor of the sector, we might see prices coming back up. Uh, however, the latest statements shows us that this scenario is unlikely. Uh, the second risk I want to talk about is uh, we need to monitor the weather. So far, we believe in a recovery. However, if weather surprises with an extension of the precipitation period and excessive cloudiness, there could be a downturn. Okay, so weather and governments are the main risk for the biggest sugar supplier in the world, Brazil. Okay, yeah. so we'll monitor that closely during this year. Thanks, Matheus. It was very nice having you here. My pleasure. Bye, everyone. Bye, Livia. Bye-bye. Now, to wrap it all up and talk about Sugar 2023 Outlook, we have Murilo Melo, our head of Sugar Americas. Hi, Murilo. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Hello, Olivia. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you. So we've entered a bearish market with an expected surplus. We've been discussing this with previous guests, and it would be interesting to understand why has an speculative positioning switch it in the verge of this uh, bearish market so far. So why are funds staying long while they usually go short in a surplus of, or a small deficit outlook? Yes, Livia, I think you're right. Um, there is an expected slight bearishness, both from uh, uh, surplus S&D as well as surplus trade flows in 2023. But uh, one should also consider that until very recently, we had a, a, a slight tightness in the markets uh, due to delay starts of the crop in the northern hemispheres. And also, we do still have uncertainty coming from the Indian crop and whether eventually the Indian government will be allowing for additional exports of quotas or not. So um, if we add this uh, to this picture, a supportive long-term long -term view, because I mean, uh, demand keeps growing year by year by year, and at the same time we are we are facing switch um, from India as well as Guatemala uh, of sugar going into ethanol. And one should never forget the most important is that there's been no new capex um, for expansion in the main crops. So the long term horizon is quite supportive on the on the fundamental um, fundamentals, but. Um, we also should understand that there's, there's a supportive macro scenario. China is coming out of COVID restrictions, and this is putting pressure as demand in most commodities should increase. Uh, take a look on what just recently happened in iron ore, in copper, in crude oil, and that also could explain strength in sugar. Um, if you consider additionally that the dollar index has been weakening and uh, the, the trend for the weakness in the dollar index keeps for the future and weakening dollar um, it's good for commodity prices in general as it, uh, it does increase the, the the purchasing power parity for consuming countries and it also increases the willingness of producers to export at a lower dollar denominated prices for their commodities and lately uh, one should not forget that uh, inflation has been coming down but remains at uh, high elevated levels. And that's certainly supported for commodities on the macro uh, picture. So I think all that could explain why the funds, despite eventually a slight um, fundamental bearishness, why, they, why they're comfortable having their loans on. I see. And on your view, what are the risks that we have to this, uh, to this outlook, to this bearishness in terms both of even more bearish scenario or a bullish turn around, right? What are the risks you see this year? Yes, well, there's, there are certainly risks both for, for the upside as well as the downside. There's also, there's always uncertainty on the market. On, uh, on, on, on a bullish note, uh, I'm sorry, on a bearish note uh, to start with, um, we could always um, uh, think about whether uh, going well in Brazil uh, boosting Brazilian crops and also allowing for an early start of the crop, which could put pressure on the spreads as well. Um, as well, uh, we could see weather going well until the end of the Indian crop. We could help to confirm 
um, a, a strong Indian crop production. On the bullish side, I would also point to weather disruptions, weather in current Indian and Thailand or central crop, as well as weather disruptions for the future Brazilian crop. And um, last but not least, there are big uncertainties on the market that as mentioned in regards to the Brazilian um, policy on uh, government policy for gasoline and, and does ethanol. I mean, the government is deciding whether he's going to be reinstating the taxes on gasoline or not, as well as tr deciding whether domestic Brazilian gasoline should be in parity to international gasoline prices. And this has important implications as it could deteriorate the picture for ethanol, ethanol margins, and also affecting sugar mix as well as the, as the sugar um, ethanol parity floor. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so we got a lot to look at, right? We have to take uh, take measurement of weather, consider also what government's gonna do. There are a bunch of risks that we need to, to take a look. And in this context of many risks, how do you see risk management and its importance? Well, you're absolutely right, Livia. Risk management is, is very critical for commodities players in general. Um, commodity players, they are in general price takers. So they don't control where prices are going and they don't control the price tag they put on their products. So in that sense, it's very important to understand the market and understand where prices are going. So you can protect your company exposure and at the same time, position the company to take advantage of future price moves. Hedging through options allow the flexibility and optionality to protect the company exposure and to capture benefits of future price moves. In that sense, we, Hedgepoint, we offer to sugar producers risk management products to protect the downside on prices while capturing upside prices to improve the, the profitability of the company. In the same way, uh, Hedgepoint, we can offer consumers and FMCG companies uh, risk management solutions to assure a maximum purchase price at the same time that allowing uh, the lowering price of acquisition of their goods in case price keep coming down. Or even with Hedgepoint, we can also offer to traders the ability to improve the margin on acquiring goods or selling goods through option structures. That's perfect. It's it's very elucidative of what we can have. And thanks so much for your patience and for being here with us, Murilo. It was really great. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me here. Well, thanks for sticking with us uh, while we took a tour on the sugar global market. But now your journey continues with Thais. Thank you, Livia. Thank you so much for leading this discussion on sugar. And a big thank you to Murilo, Vipu, Mateus, Gabriel for their insights. I understand that we still have a lot to wait for in the sugar market, so we can have an even clearer picture during the year. It's a fundamentally bearish year. It's important to highlight that with an expected surplus. However, weather and government still play key roles when it comes to volatility. So an important market for us to keep to keep a close look into it during 2023. Uh, thank you once again. I'd like to take a minute to share with you some great news. We have recently launched Headpoint Academy, an online platform specialized in financial education for professionals in demand agriculture and energy commodity markets. As our official learning resource, Headpoint Academy aims to capacitate traders, sellers, and consumers through in deep knowledge about risk management and hedging tools. We offer objective and fast-paced courses composed by singular top videos designed for professionals look to advance their knowledge using an innovative digital learning platform. Currently, all courses offered are in Portuguese. However, courses in English and Spanish are coming soon. What's more, you can take the beginning course on fundamental concepts in hedging for free access hedgepointacademy.com and use our special voucher webinar 2023. See you there. Bem-vindo à Hedgepoint Academy. 
o seu portal de aprendizagem sobre gerenciamento de riscos em commodities. Nascemos com a missão de democratizar o conhecimento sobre o Red, desmistificando a complexidade das operações financeiras, por meio de exemplos práticos e objetivos, focados na realidade de cada grupo de commodities, grãos e oleaginosas, café, açúcar, energia e moedas. Evolua a sua forma de fazer negócio e tem autonomia de gerenciar melhor seus riscos financeiros através do conhecimento. Embarque nessa jornada de aprendizado com a Redpoint Academy. Before we continue, I'd like to thank you all the viewers who have been watching us so far and also welcome all the other viewers who have just joined our streaming. I'd like to remind you that our live chat feature is available. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Our experts are available to help. Also, please complete our succession survey. Your opinion really matters for us. As a bonus, we will receive a link to the recorded webinar so we can go back to the great discussions we are having today. Up next, we are joined by Natalia from our market intelligence team, followed by Michael, our risk management expert for the cough market in Europe, Edelso, the head of our cough risk management team in Brazil, is speaking from our office in Sao Paulo. Their discussions will revolve around the status of the global cough market and what the future holds for this wonderful commodity that helps us, all of us, right, get going in the morning. Welcome, Natalia, Edelso, and you. Hello, Thais, and thank you for the opportunity to share an overview of Coffee Fundamentals for 2023. First, we will explore some of these fundamentals from the origin side with Edelso, our head of coffee here at Hedgepoint. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for our viewers. And uh, I'll be here to try to speak a little bit about coffee this afternoon. Thank you, Adelcio. Uh, so, Adelcio, we've started 2023 with a major drop in coffee prices, which was a reflection of increased optimism regarding the Brazilian crop with potentially higher yields than initially expected, as well as a bearish macroeconomic outlook, as we've explored, explored earlier today in our roundtables discussions. This, alongside a stronger uh, Brazilian currency, led differential levels in Brazil to shoot up, with high screens and fine and good cups turning positive, leaving a lot of distortion between buyers and sellers. How are these levels affecting the farmer here in Brazil, and what are some of opportunities that you see to manage the risks associated with this market outlook? Yeah, uh, farmers have been waiting uh, for better prices since market started to get lower and lower, what uh, started in last October. Uh, they have been holding their coffee and uh, the volume uh, in their hands, I believe that's one of the highest for the last years. Uh, as the switch uh, were inverted, so uh, the, the spot market was more expensive than the Ford, the buyers were not willing to carry stocks. So it's why most of producers had to keep their cough on their own, in their own hands. Uh, this situation are making producers' lives even worse, even harder. Uh, on the other hand, producers are, care, uh, like I said, producers are carrying stocks, not willing to sell at lower levels. On the other hand, the exporters that need this coffee are uh, having a lot of trouble to get uh, to their exporters uh, done. So uh, the, the differentials are very strong. Uh, producers are holding cough. So what could bring uh, a lot of, what could still bring a lot of uh, problems to the, the cough chain? Uh, market has been in a lower trend. So uh, it's uh, making uh, even more difficult the situation. Uh, what could uh, make all the highs uh, as a uh, sell opportunity and the try to in uh, so maybe a way to try to recover exports and producer losses. Right. And that was you taking a little bit 
from what we discussed, it's established now that the 20 to 23 cycle is marked by a deficit, right? And um, we estimate we estimate that deficit between the low range and the high range of estimates between uh, minus 1.2 and minus 4.2 million bags, right? Uh, which is still pending on a fine tuning of centrals and Columbia production figures once the harvest is done, right? Uh, as well as the overall demand that we have throughout uh, September. Still, uh, that deficit seems to have been fully priced in already, and Brazil is likely to drive a surplus, right, in 23-24, the 23-24 cycle. And with our base case for the next cycle being 3.7 million bags of surplus, that switch from two back-to-back -back deficits and lower stocks at origins to a projected surplus uh, left the market currently lacking a strong price reference. And as you said, uh, farmers are holding these, these stocks. The situation from 22, 23 is changing. The landscape is changing uh, towards 23, 24, right? So following this initial period where the market digests the projected surplus and thinking about mid 2023 with the Brazilian harvest and exports off season on the background, how do you see the market responding? Yeah, uh, I believe that not even the most pessimistic cough market participant would think that uh, we were around in 150s, 140s, early G January 2023. So uh, the economic power from funds, I believe uh, that the doubts regarding consumption resilience in a recession period and uh, uh, next crop from Brazil, this, this year crop, 23-24, uh, better numbers brought the market a lot of pressure and made almost all origins delay on their fixations and put a cap on the market. Uh, in the Brazilian off-season crop, a low co coffee uh, quantity from the last crop to be commercialized and with a very difficult market ex to export to originate coffee uh, in this market should keep quiet until uh, at least new Brazilian crop start to be available uh, and have a strong price or have a strong price recover uh, what could bring to producers and exporters uh, better prices and wider differentials, what could make both uh, lives better and easier. But it's not uh, easy because funds are too heavy on their sales, so uh, it's not easy to, to have a very big uh, recover. Indeed. We've seen um, a very large addition to the sell side, especially in the last CF CFTC, right? And we have plenty of ch challenges in the first half of 2023 already for coffee. And it tells you, focusing now on the second half of the year, we have the highly anticipated 24-25 Brazilian crop development. And the first point is that we need to highlight is weather. The ENSO status is expected to turn from La Nina to El Nino already in the first quarter and persist at least through October. The phenomenon leads to warmer temperatures over coffee areas, also possibly disrupting rainfall patterns, but lowers the possibility of frosts during winter too. How do you see the 24-25 crop potential affecting the market? Uh, having less two years in a much lower crop and much lower from it, uh, its potential uh, due to lack of rains or maybe uh, due to a frost, areas uh, under uh, most of areas were under production. production. So the, uh, there is a power reserve for a big crop, uh, what seems not happen for one more year. So this year we will not have all the potential that we should have. That could bring uh the its hold potential for a big crop 24 25 bringing uh, a lot of coffee and make uh, making the the prices under a, a, a huge pressure again uh having the chance that we can have a better crop a better crop in terms of production mark uh, could have wider export differentials and uh, as we could we should have more coffee available to be commercialized and uh, that it may be uh, lower prices paid to the producer. So the, the reason between the relation between the, the production costs and the market prices 
could be worse than we are seeing now, even worse. Uh, market uh, could be under pressure because of this uh, size of potential crop. So uh, we can see uh, that uh, the, the exporters and producers in a maybe difficult uh, year again. Yeah, we're definitely seeing a change in the structure, in the landscape. We're moving from uh, two back-to-back -to -back deficits towards a very likely surplus. And especially when we talk about the second half of the year with the potential of the 24-25 crop here in Brazil. Adelcio, thank you so much for sharing your view with us. I'm sure that everybody at home uh, learned something new today. And thank you so much again. Thank you. All right, moving on to our EMEA expert. Let's take a look at the destination landscape with Ian Michael. Ian, Green Coffee Association stocks have finally shown results according to seasonality in December after increasing above the seasonal pattern through most of 2022. Stocks and destinations are seasonally elevated when we consider the last updates available for GCA and ECF stocks. Also, based on commercial positioning, there doesn't seem to be a big rush to buy. The question now that remains is if commitments are seasonally high and how the perspective of Brazilian 23-24 crop has gotten buyers on the sidelines, if at all. How do you see that destination dynamic in this first semester? Well, Natalia... We have had two exceptional years of massively changing drinking habits in many parts of the world. The out-of-home consumption has dropped by 98 plus percent during COVID lockdowns and at-home consumption went up massively. So coffee was not consumed as per cup anymore, it was consumed as per pot, which automatically then results in a higher consumption number as a higher percentage of coffee is wasted and not being drunk. Aside from this, we have seen a massive drop in global transportation capacities during the last years, like ever grant uh, container shortages and less voyages during COVID, and a higher usage of spot positions due to the logistical issues in 21, 22, which led to lower, lower stocks, not only in coffee everywhere, um, at destinations. A fact also reflected in historical low I certified stocks. And by now, we are going back to closer to normal stocks at destination as trade houses started to ship coffee in break bulk from certain origins, like Vietnam and Brazil which allowed a much higher destination delivery than with container shipments. And many industry buyers purchased a lot more of coffee when for, uh, for forward when C was around $1 and origin will to sell way forward. With the inflations and, and, and interest increase in rates and a strong fear of an again inverted market, origin is still unwilling to go back to too much forward selling. And a rebuilding of stocks at destination and um, FOB differentials, which have not really reflected the market movements have lead to a certain self-effacement at buyer side. I would say it is a sit and wait and watch situation. And in regards of the 23, 24 crop in Brazil, buyers are careful as there is a fear of defaults and quality issues. If coffee is already at destination, they can more easily control the quality without a negative surprise. Um, hence, the market is bringing back trade houses to take the role of guaranteeing the supply chain and financing and spot market is rather active now for cash and carry positions to fill gaps overall i would think uh, most industry buyers will have or are about to start already to think about the 24 deliveries and started to cover a minority of positions uh, with bigger trunk to fall in the second quarter of 2023 right uh and when we think about the second half of 2023 um we're likely uh, to see that trigger in a switch and how the market perceives demand, right? On um, macroeconomic indicators show some breathing room in terms of economic activity growth, credit, and financing. The um, scenario becomes especially optimistic for demand when we consider the 23-24 cycle. And as we've discussed in this panel, there are some major risks to the supply side uh, with weather becoming more unpredictable by the day. Can we expect the current trend of lower stock to use ratio in origins to remain throughout 2023? And how could we see differentials responding to that? Medium to long term analysis, I would say, are very uncertain by default. Maybe we can do some mapping of potential risks that might arise throughout the year. We have seen so many things in the last 12 months which we have never been able to think about before. And this might be the case for a long time forward now. 
Clear is that buyers want to see goods at destination. Questionable is the percentage of destination stocks which is committed and which is free for new sales, which answers is directly impacting the stock to use ratio. In regards of differentials, we must keep an eye on production and financing costs at origin, as well as the labor availability. Differentials are currently kind of unconnected to the markets and both sellers and buyers have learned to accept higher diffs than in the old days. I personally do not see massive changes in differentials to the downside. And with the current market volatility, I think markets are rather trying to define a base for 23 right now, which will be influenced by macroeconomic factors, currencies, and whatever might happen in global politics. Exactly. Uh, Ian, that was an amazing discussion. Thank you for participating. Thank you very much. And now I hand it over to Thais. Thank you. Thank you, guys, for that great discussion on coffee. I'm sure our viewers really enjoy it. I'd like to highlight just why macroeconomic and technical factors have held and still expect to hold a lot of influence of coffee prices. That is clear that Brazilian Araca production potential for both current and next crop will guide prices through the year. And especially when you talk about a year of El Nino. So El Nino coming up, there are more risks on the supply side, especially in a market as the name has called. It has been a very exciting day so far. We hope you have found the information we have presented very useful. Up next, I would like to introduce Davi from our market intelligence team and our risk management experts in Cotton, Andy from our U.S. agriculture team based in Chicago, and Victor from our grains team in Brazil talking from Mato Grosso. It's great being with you, Andy, and you, Victor, here today to begin our discussion. One of the main market topics we'll have to discuss for 2023 for commodities as a whole will be China's reopening, and cotton is no exception. So I'd like to begin our debate today asking about your perspectives or, for example, how soon do, can we expect market to be affected? How soon can we expect imports to rise up? And who will, we will likely take the lion's share of the Chinese market? Thank you. Thanks, David. It's good to be here today. Uh, speaking of China, uh, regarding cotton, China is the historically the number one importer of cotton. Uh, the United States is historically the number one exporter of cotton. Uh, as China begins to reopen, uh, we look for a resurgence in demand for raw cotton. Uh, in early January of 2022, I began hearing about uh, China, Chinese mills and Chinese merchants inquiring for U.S. cotton, again, <clears throat> after a long uh, doldrum, so to speak. Um, then in during January, we saw China uh, emerge as the number one importer and purchaser of U.S. cotton on the U.S. weekly export sales reports. Uh, so I think we already have some evidence that China, with regard to U.S. cotton at least, uh, is their demand is coming back and maybe in a very big way. And Victor, what do you agree with Andy? Do you see that same prospects and how will Brazil's crop, crop be affected by China's reopening? Well, uh, first of all, thanks, for, thanks, Thais and David for having me. Thanks, Andy, to share the screen panel with you. Uh, well, I, I do totally agree with Andy. Now, it's all about to what extent China demand will come uh, more or less aggressive and worldwide markets and, and global trade has uh, paying too much uh, attention to this this uh, upcoming uh, in looming uh, China comeback to the market, especially because global demand seems to be a little kind of uh, of dormant. So we have seen throughout latest ways the estimates that global uh, global cotton uh, domestic consumption worldwide consumption is altering. It's, we have this, we are about to see the second lowest. Uh, the global demand uh, within the span of not nearly 10 years. And now it's all about uh, until until China come back, markets will play, will pay a, a closer attention to supply side fundamentals. And now uh, drivers from the supply side tends to to add or reduce uh, weather risk premium, especially here in Brazil, along as uh, corn and I bought corn futures 
over a New York Board of Trade. Yeah, in, in this topic of supply, I have a question for Andy. So, Andy, how do you see United States perform when you talk about cotton, cotton wet rates? Do you see any possible reduction or, or losing ground in this next crop? Yes. It, as a matter of fact, uh, many experts across the United States uh, and analysts are looking for a dramatic uh, reduction in U.S. cotton acreage. Uh, traditionally, cotton in the southeast United States competes with peanuts and corn uh, to a lesser extent. Uh, in the Mid-South, it competes mainly with corn and soybeans. And in the Texas area, it competes mainly with corn and to a lesser extent wheat. Uh, across the board, uh, cotton, price, cotton forward prices are below the cost of production. So with, uh, you know, in some cases, four to five cents below the cost of production uh, versus corn and soybean and wheat prices a year ago. Cotton has not uh, made any advances and these competing crops are actually more favorable financially for the farmers. So there are some people who are looking for U.S. cotton acreage where it was around 12 million acres last year to fall possibly below 10 million acres. And in Brazil, we have a quite different situation, right, Victor? With government agencies like Conab or the USDA expecting higher acreage, higher yields, and thus higher production. And one of the main drivers of this said expected yields would be the weather, which has not, so far not been so disappointing. And that being said, what are your expectations for Mato Grosso's crop? Do you agree with that, that with those estimates? Right on, right on, David. Well, just uh, just taking in a little bit of attention now and come from south, from south, okay? So, mark this switch attention for Metro Grosso crop. So, as we have seen ways in Conab, it's kind of just converging for the same uh, forecast in terms of uh, Brazilian overall cotton uh, production for 22 century season. Which is, is it's which it's uh, planting progress is, is getting underway uh, along Brazilian uh, power producing states, but the issue not is not about acreage and yield expectation anymore. For sure, we had in the, in especially, especially in late 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 December, early January, we had such pretty good scenario, uh, especially because we have a, a pretty timely uh, first season crop, soybean crop planting. Which allow the farmers to 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 harvest that on time and have a, a second winter crop, especially in cotton, in a timely uh, in, in, inside the ideal planting window here in Brazil, which ends generally ends at the end of January. So now uh, we have some issues. We do have some problems because in so far as that farmers managed to have a timely planting in the second car, uh, cotton crop. Let, let's set aside. Let's set apart some scenarios here in Brazil. Brazil overall cotton production is divided between the, the summer crop, okay, the summer cotton crop and the winter cotton crop. In summer cotton crop, we have the lion's share and the bulk of, uh, of cotton production uh, uh, le being led by um, uh, northeast Brazil, especially Bahia, which amounts to roughly 600,000 metric tons yearly. Uh, in, but the last but not the least, I mean, is the, the, the major uh, the cotton producer and driver here in Brazil, which, which is Mato Grosso, the, the heartland of agriculture in Brazil. Mato Grosso itself amounts to nearly two thirds of the entire cotton crop. That's very substantial. So when you talk about Brazilian cotton crop, you talking about Mato Grosso, Midwest Brazilian cotton crop, because Mato Grosso itself is about to harvest it's the second largest crop ever uh, in the span of five years. Uh, that just printed, for sure, a, a, a pretty uh, optimism uh, among farmers that uh, yields could be better and they ramp up in acreage. Acreage here in Brazil for second crop it competes directly versus corn. So when you talk about cotton, you must look at corn acreage because they are going to compete uh, against each other to, to, to see which will take the lion's share. And 
cotton for sure has a, a better revenue potential here in Brazil, and that has led since the, the, the past five years to farmers to switch corn acreage to cotton. But uh, okay, that's that's really happening here in Mato Grosso. Mato Grosso will have its largest acreage uh, ever. So now it's all about yield because we had from a timely planted first soy, first crop soybean planting to some lagging in harvest delay. Now overall soybean harvest delay in Brazil is pretty pretty significant, substantial. Brazil has already harvested something like five percent of its entire crop. Metro Grosso it's is like 20 points behind since last years. And what we, we have seen that now is that the more soybean harvest delay we are seeing, the more cotton planting delay we are seeing. And now cotton planting here in Metro Grosso is around 54% of its acreage, which is uh, nearly two points uh, behind uh, 21, 22 season. And now this is plugging and adding some risk premium over domestic cash market basis and to, and to a, a last extent to over New York Board of Trade Futures. Thanks. Thank you very much, MJ and Victor, for the great insights. Now I'll leave it with Thais to continue our webinar. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. It was great insights from, from the cotton market. So it's important to keep track of the main economic aspects, as you highlighted, so West and China, namely inflation, economic growth, while also paying attention to oil prices, man-made textiles. When we talk about supply, as highlighted by Vitor, the, Vitor, the weather in Brazil, Mato Grosso State, has so far played alone, but any sudden change could be a very impactful for the country's promised cotton crop. Before we move on to our last season of the day, I kindly ask you once again to complete our succession survey. You can scan the care code on the screen. Your feedback will help us to make next events even better. We have made it to our last session of the day. Before we get started, I invite you please to use our live chat through the session to ask questions. And for now, for great sessions, we have all star team joining us right now. Our experts from United States, Europe, Brazil, Argentina will be here to share their perspectives for the global grains market. First, I'd like to introduce Pedro and Davi from Market Intelligence Team based in Campinas, Brazil. Joining them now, we have Sol, the head of Grains Latam based in Rosario, Argentina, to explore some aspects of this market in her region. So with now with you guys, thank you. Thank you, Thais. Uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you, Sol, for joining us here. And I'm really eager to start discussing grains uh, with Sol because Argentina has been on the spotlight this past couple of months, this weather market in South America. And we all know that the dryness has been hurting uh, Argentina, especially soybean planting, in Ar uh, soybean crop in Argentina, which is the largest supplier of meal and oil to the world. And I wanted to ask, uh, to, to ask you, Saul, uh, how do you think uh, that will change, that will affect uh, global and also domestic trade uh, in the region? Hello, everybody. Well, uh, we lost 20, 25 percent of our soybean crop. That's that is a fact uh, that it's already on the market and that is already on, on the prices on, on the local basis, uh, on the South American basis that had been affected by that fact. Uh, the the 2022 has has been a, quite an special year for the Argentine agribusiness. We had the world drop in 60 years, not only affecting soybean crop, the planting intention, the planting pace, but also the wheat. Okay, we lost 40% of our wheat production due to the lack of rains and due to the late frost there. Uh, regarding soybeans, it's important to highlight that Argentina, as you said, is the main exporter, has the main share of, of soybean meal and soybean oil uh, due to the fact that we have such an shut such a special and competitive cluster, soybean crushing cluster here in Rosario by the Paraná River, where 90% of the soybean is crushed and 90% of that crushing products are exported by the Rosario River, by the Rosario port. So uh, 
this is key for the international market. This is not has not been only a problem for Argentina. This has been a problem for them for the global market. At the soybean meal that is exported by Argentina is hard to be replaced. Um, we can have a. Um, uh, we can have palm oil, soybean, uh, sunflower oil, rapeseed oil for uh, compensating the lack of bean oil uh, production. But for big protein, you need uh, for competitive soybean milk sports, you need Argentina. Uh, that is why we saw that increase uh, in the prices, mainly in soybean and the reduction in bean oil. Uh, and that uh, was really a uh, picture uh, that was really showing on the evolution of the oil share spread. I love following the spreads that really tell about the supply and demand situation of the, of the markets. That's a very interesting. So as you have discussed several important aspects for the markets, like expected profitability, weather impacts, et cetera. And looking forward to, for, to Argentina, can we expect a move from Argentinian farmers to drop wheat acreage in favor of barley, for example, as we saw the last cycle due to expected profitability in barley being better? Well, uh, this this has this is going to be a very interesting year for for Argentina, the 2023. Um, we are waiting. Uh, a change in the weather pattern. We are also seeing better rains uh, late in late January. So we are expecting better weather conditions for the week, for the wheat uh, production, for the uh, planting uh, of the wheat and barley of the winter crops in next April, May. So, um, and apart from that, we are having elections, uh, national elections this season. Uh, we are having our first round in August. Um, so this is key due to the due to the role that play the agribusiness in Argentina and all you know the export tax, the um, the spreads in the financial and the commercial exchange rates. So. Uh, I do believe that farmers, considering the expectation of a new government, maybe uh, with a much friendly environment for the for the uh, for the export side of the story, uh, we will we, we'll see uh, a good planting intention for both for wheat and for barley. Uh, I think that Argentina is going to come back to the market with a, a 20 million tons of wheat production next, next season. And one of the things that have pushed farmers to make this decision last year and may appear again this cycle is the difficulties in input importing. And can you expect that to repeat, uh, to repeat itself in this year? Well, uh, due to the, all these commercial disruptions we have in Argentina, due, due to the spreads in the ex exchange rates and all the um, controls we have in the commercial flows for imports and exports, uh, it has been challenging for the industry in, Ar in Argentina for getting inputs, uh, for getting supplies. But the the industry that creates more more foreign foreign uh, currency for for the argentina government for the argentine administration is the farming industry so we didn't see much travel in importing fertilizers or seeds uh, actually the farming industry in argentina is super competitive related to using uh taking care of soils um um, producing with uh, super um, professionally due to the due to the situation that commercially we have so so much disadvantage that uh, getting into being competitive uh, on the production side is a must. Um, 
that is why I'm I, I'm also supportive about the, the situation for the seed in this autumn for wheat um, barley in Argentina. We have discussed several fundamentals that may have an impact on marketing from economics to politics and the weather. And since we are a, a risk management company, I would like to ask you a question that we have asked to all other heads of, heads of desks today. What are the main actions, what are the main possibilities that farmers and uh, market participants should explore in 2023? Well, we, again, uh, volatility is going to be the key, the key word to have in mind. Uh, I think that our role is getting more and more important for society, the risk management, uh, the risk management service for the for a key industry as as it is the food and energy industry. We have seen the inflation rates this season, so taking care of the of 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 hitting uh, prices for commodity is a must. We still have the Black Sea war around. It's as as sad as it is. It is. Is still uh, affecting our our market flow and our market prices, and extreme weather is already there. So we saw that not only in the Argentine soybean production that we described at the beginning of our talk, but also uh, related to the extreme weather that the the winter wheat is facing in the United States. So we have still story to, to tell about volatility in this 2023. So, can I ask everybody to support you? Thank you, Saul. Those were great insights. And uh, I'm really thankful to have you to have had you uh, here today with us to discuss a little bit about grains. Um, it, it, it was our pleasure always being working along with you guys. Can I ask on our on our team to support? Thank you, Davi, as well. Uh, and now I'll pass back to Thais uh, for uh, for us to continue with the session over here. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate your contribution and want to thank you for the points you made about the Latin American market and see you in the next panel. Now we'll move to Brazil with Marcelo, the head of risk management for Greens in Brazil, speaking from our Sao Paulo office. I also would like to invite Pedro and Aleph for joining us one more time today. Pedro, I'll hand it to you. Thank you once again, Thais. Uh, thank you, Marcelo, for being here with us. I'm really happy to continue discussing South American grains. And so first question to you, Marcelo. Uh, we have seen Brazil breaking uh, record after record and production terms, especially of soybeans and corn in this last couple of years. But it has not been without uh, some hiccups. And we have seen a crop failure on corn and a crop failure on soybeans uh, over this past couple of uh, crops, couple of cycles. So and right now we have a, a big expectations uh, on, on the on the soybean crop, especially that is being harvested as we speak. And I wanted to ask you, uh, how is market reading? How uh, and if I may ask, how are you reading uh, this, this expectations and how should it impact the market as well? Yeah, um, hi Pedro, hi Aleph, thanks for inviting me to this webinar. Um, so let's go to your question here and, and try to ask that and try to answer your question as clear as possible in my opinion. So that uh, the way I see it today, the market is being pricing uh, this climate risk, uh, already pricing this climate risk, especially considering Argentina crop that's coming. So we've been seeing a lot of premium uh, on this um, near contracts. As you can see, the the, uh, the curve is inverted. So that's that's been telling us a lot about what market is actually expecting from our current crop. Uh, the thing is that there is a, a very tight balance sheet on the United States and um, until we have a more defined crop for South America, prices will still uh, be high on the near term and shorter uh, will be actually lower on the on the long term of this curve. Right. So uh, in my opinion, markets been pricing this uh, this risk of climate risk in, in Argentina, but haven't really understand the, the, the size of the Brazilian crop 
which should be, in my opinion, the biggest crop uh, Brazil ever had. So we are we are forecasting about 150 million tons of soybean in Brazil. There is some uh, um, some cut uh, on expectations of harvesting and production, especially in Rio Grande do Sul state. But we are talking about three to four million tons less than what was expected. But we sure should have more than that coming from Goiás state, from Mato Grosso state, which um, are states that represent uh, a big volume of soybean that's produced in Brazil. So in my opinion, the market's been pricing a lot of risk for Argentina, uh, especially when some of the data coming from Argentina told us that uh, the crop could be something between 37 million tons, which, it, which would be uh, one of the worst crops ever in Argentina. Uh, and since we got this, uh, um, this data coming from Argentina, uh, um, we, we've been seeing only uh, couple of weather news uh, that will be positive, in my opinion, for the next days to come, right? So February is a very important month uh, for the crop in Argentina, and we should see, uh, according to these weather forecasts, especially the European models, we should see uh, more rains coming in, and this will actually, in my opinion, favor the, the market and the price as soon as the Brazilian crop comes in and start being shipping out of Brazil, this should affect the prices and the curve could get back to carry, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, Marcelo, that's great. And also with this scenario of the Brazilian crop and with the situation in Argentina, and also when we look backwards at uh, also Ukraine having a, a smaller corn crop, the US coming from smaller uh, crops, both, both of soybeans and in corn, so we are seeing a tight uh, balance uh, for both uh, grains in the 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 world scenario. So, how you you see like the Brazilian producers and exporters of both soybeans and corn? How uh, what's it it's going to be their role like, in the international market? And what are the main opportunities for them in this uh, tight balances uh, scenario? That's, that's a good question, Aleph. Um, I think that uh, that's uh, good times for Brazil, in my opinion, for Brazilian farmers. Um, We're seeing uh, actually China is starting to buy corn from Brazil uh, starting on the last semester of last year. Uh, and this should be a very big opportunity, in my opinion, to Brazil, especially now that uh, we have a shorter, uh, um, we have a forecast of a shorter crop of corn in, in, in European Union. Uh, we have uh, uh, maybe uh, a bad crop, first crop in Argentina, right? There's still there's still some some data to come, but uh, we, sh we should have a bad first crop in Argentina. We should have a bad crop in European Union. So that's a good opportunity, in my opinion, uh, for uh, Brazil to actually increase its exports on corn. Uh, we know we are the biggest exporter of soybean, but not yet for corn. And that's definitely um, regarding all this geopolitical crisis that we're living, um, including one of the main exporters of corn around the globe, which is Ukraine. That's definitely a good opportunity for Brazil uh, in order to fulfill the gaps in this um, external market, in my opinion. Yeah, indeed. But on the other side, uh, we have the the currency uh, kind of a overview, as we mentioned in our in our macro presentation uh, sooner today. Uh, we see kind of a, a, a valuation trend for the the emerging currencies in, in general, a strengthening of the emerging markets currencies, given the the bullish scenario for for commodities and the the BRL may probably will participate from this. Uh, strengthening that we are seeing and that kind of a goes like on the other side it, it can uh, uh, maybe uh, reduce a Brazilian export or at least not incentivize the exports and I would like to uh, have your vision on that do you think that uh, the BRL strengthening can uh, reduce the these exports given the, the whole scenario that you mentioned and do you see other macro fundamentals like impacting the flow of, of Brazilian exports in this year? Okay, yeah, good question as well. I guess said that um, the the BRL strengthening can actually um, 
make Brazilian corn more expensive, right? So that's the point that you that you're making here, and, and I agree with you. But also, the BRL strengthening can also uh, make it cheaper for Brazilian farmers to buy urea, for example, or mm -hmm. other uh, fertilizers and inputs that are used to produce corn, right? So um, I guess that it's not always about price, but um, it's it's always about margins, right? That's going that's what's going to make farmers um, plant more corn. And if we have more corn, then we will have uh, uh, um, uh, lower costs of production. And then we could sell our products or corn uh, for a cheaper price, even though the BRL is strengthening, right? So in my opinion, uh, you're right. I mean, the, the BRL, if the BRL strengths, uh, our corn tends to become uh, more expensive but we are in a very tight balance sheet, worldwide speaking. So uh, considering the, the, the balance sheet of corn in the United States, the main producer um, together with China, uh, we, we should see, uh, and, and I mean, as far as I can tell, uh, this crisis between Ukraine and Russia tends to continue, uh, which will um, affect the, the Ukraine's capability of producing corn and actually feeding the European Union. So I believe we still see a lot of opportunities for the Brazilian corn, even if the BRL strains uh, a little bit more due to this uh, um, balance sheet scenario, very tight balance sheet scenario, uh, worldwide speaking. Awesome. And again, to, to, to conclude, because uh, I think we are a bit running out of time, but uh, you have touched on several really important points that are, have brought volatility in the past and will continue to do so. And a question that we have been asking all of our guests today is, uh, given all of this that we have discussed, what do you think will be the key struggles, the key decisions that agents, farmers, consumers will have to make this year? And what are the risks that are involved in them? How can we expect to, how can they expect to protect themselves? Uh, against it right um well this this is definitely a challenge um, um it is a it is a crop especially for brazilian farmers i would say uh, there's a big challenge here we have a very uh small uh, farmer selling uh, compared to other years so uh, farmers are are definitely holding back to their uh their productions we are going uh, in my opinion, to to have uh, the largest soybean crop ever uh, in Brazil. We are expanding uh, not only in yields, but also expanding in territory acreage in Brazil. So we are going to see a, a, the largest crop ever. So this will be higher than our uh, um, storage capabilities in Brazil. So I guess that um, for consumers, and for tradings, the logistics will be an issue, in my opinion. Harvest is already late uh, due to some rains that we've been seeing in, in Brazil. Late rains that are actually affecting the harvest, um, the harvest spirit in Brazil. So I guess that logistics will be an issue, especially for tradings and for farmers. I guess that we are um, going to see a big drop on prices, in my opinion. Um, mostly because uh, there is going to be a big crop in Brazil and we are facing the, the most expensive crop ever of soybean in Brazil as well. So considering that farmers have the most expensive crop ever in Brazil and the farmer selling is very low, um, I guess this is one of the main uh, uh, challenges that farmer will face in my opinion, there's a lot of potential for downside in prices here uh, once we start harvesting Brazilian soybeans. So I guess that uh, risk management is, is the key word, is the key word here. So um, I would definitely uh, um, incentivize um, farmers and both farmers and tradings and consumers uh, to actually hedge and protect their margins because, uh, I mean, volatility will be there, in my opinion, due to either um, number, the real number of the, the crop in, in, in Argentina, 
either because of logistics issues we're going to have in Brazil, so either because of costs. So I guess that um, protecting margins and hedge is the name of the game now. Awesome. Always great talking to you, Marcelo. Thank you again for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for inviting me. Great, great job. And now I'll pass back to Thais to continue our session on grains. Great insights, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Going to Europe now, Iago will join us. Iago is the head of our EMEA team, He's speaking from our office in Zurich. Welcome, Iago. And to continue this discussion, I'd like to call again Aleph and David. Welcome, Aleph and David. Yeah, thanks, Thais. So now moving on to the EMEA markets, talking about grains. It's a pleasure to have Iago here to talk about all the, the main prospects and outlooks we will be having for the European market in 2023. And firstly, Iago, I'd like to start uh, talking about uh, the, Euro, the European uh, wheat. Uh, we know that uh, Europe had a slightly smaller crop in 2022-23 uh, due to some droughts and also uh, hot temperatures. And but uh, nonetheless, there, we're seeing like a good exporting flow from 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 Europe. And I'd like to ask you, what are your prospects for the 23-24 crop? And do you think that Europe will be will keep this good exporting flow uh, throughout uh, this year? Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for having me in this webinar. So basically, regarding the EU crop, I'm mean, speaking of the 23-24 season. In fact, we have a bigger acreage, a bigger planted area. So good crop conditions could lead effectively to a bigger crop than the last year, which was roughly 134 million tons for wheat and 54 million tons for corn. So nevertheless, I mean, the European crop is also experiencing a warmer than usual weather with temperatures about eight degrees higher than the average of the past few years. So all of this creates concerns and uncertainties in case the temperature drops suddenly again. So basically the cycle freeze, uh, warm, say that you know the risk of warm weather followed by a frost, for instance, could potentially lead to a crop damage. Always staying well, I mean, Europe with a decent crop near to 140 million tons and give all the circumstances of the war, could obviously offset a bit of the deficit created by the Black Sea, and most likely they could and should keep the strong pace of exports this year. However, I just like to call the attention for one, one particular uh, thing. Basically, the euro uh, has constantly strengthened since the end of September. So a strong euro curbs the European wheat and corn competitiveness. So in that case, buyers could seek alternative origins. So we need to keep an eye on uh, at the currency as well. Yeah, indeed, those are very good points. And now moving on to also one of the main competitors of uh, the European uh, grains, it's Russia. And now talking more about uh, wheat, we know that Russia had uh, a very uh, big crop in 2022. We need to, uh, to confirm if it was a record crop or not, but it was a huge crop. And, and also the conditions for the, the winter crop, uh, at least for now, they, they seem good. But on the other side, and there are some talks that the Russian government may uh, uh, lead uh, the producers to plant um, less area to stabilize, stabilize the internal prices. So I'd like to ask you, what's your view for the, also for the 23-24 20, crop, crops in in Russia and also if they will keep like also uh, the, the exporting flow that we're seeing that now in the, the last few months has been above five-year highs. So I'd like to ask your views on, on that. Sure. So as you said, I mean, Russia had a big crop this year. I mean, whereas uh, USA capped the estimates at 91 million tons in the last report for wheat, uh, the Russian agencies mentioned that they had produced to 100 4 million tons for wheat, roughly, and they had an outstanding 153 million tons for grains complex, which is like a huge crop. So for this year, obviously the planted area and the long-term weather forecast will dictate the size of the crop. Uh, in effect, I mean, their export pace has been already affected due to logistics, 
uh, insurance and payment issues. So on top of this, also the President Vladimir Putin had already said that this year, the country may maintain stable food reserves by limiting exports if necessary. So this raised market concerns that the exports could be cut further, not to mention the sanctions, which is always a possibility. So especially now that Western countries are increasing their support I mean, to Ukraine through equipment and tanks. So basically this year, I would say that Russia is going to be the big question mark. Uh, we are unsure about the real size of the crop, and it's not clear whether they will have export restrictions. So we need to, to monitor and follow that one closely. Indeed, Russia will be on the spot for this year and probably one of the main topics of discussion for the whole mar grain market world will be the renovation of the Grains Corridor deal, which we should begin discussion in a few weeks. And this will be very impactful for Ukrainians and for their markets. And we also expect that if the Russians do not allow Ukraine to keep exporting to the Black Sea, it will push the Ukrainian farmers to change their, their acreage. For, for example, start planting less grains and more oil seeds. And if that, this indeed uh, materializes, if this indeed happens, what market uh, impacts can we expect? Uh, that's a good question. So, so basically, I mean, I would say that for those, I mean, for all of us who are outside the country, it's very difficult I mean, to tell what's really happening and how the farmers are managing to cope with the situation, right? So, I mean, these farmers are real fighters, I would say. And basically this year, they're going to face lots of issues. I mean, they're going to have, Ukraine is going to have a lower planted area. This is one thing. They're going to have access to less, uh, lesser fertilizers. So it's roughly 40%. That's the less estimates of fertilizers they're going to have access to. And in turn, that's going to affect also the yields of the crop. Uh, they're going to have issues with liquidity, uh, the cash, the working capital, so today we have uh, don't have banks which are actually willing to lend money uh, to the Ukrainian farmers, uh, and the Ukrainian farmers were unable to buy uh, this season seeds on credit from some of these international suppliers such as France, and they had to pay in cash to pay in cash. So basically, that's another issue they're gonna had uh, they're gonna have. Uh, we have also the issues of energy, so electricity, fuel. So all these blackouts, I mean, due to the unstable power supply, the shortage of working force. And as you said, uh, that we also like this uncertainty around the renewal and the expansion of the Grand Corridor. So let's just rem remember that, I mean, obviously there's not what's happening there. It's not a special operation, it's a war. Uh, and as such, it's unpredictable. So, and we have this Green Corridor, which is vulnerable. It's not for the long term. But it's there, it's working. Uh, and basically around mid-March, uh, we expect to see the renewal and hopefully the expansion of the Green Corridor, uh, which just as an information, they allowed around uh, 50 million tons, which have passed through this Green Corridor since the beginning in, in August. And more recently, recently uh, the pace is at record low. So basically they have some issues with these delayed inspections, but it's happening, it's there. It's very important for the crop this year. So all in all, we have, I mean, the cost of production, which is uh, higher. Uh, again, let's re remember, I mean, the Ukrainian farmers don't have access to subsidy. So that's something which uh, uh, is there. And it's impossible, I mean, to increase the planted area in times like this. And as you said as well, basically one indication that we have is actually, I mean, under this scenario, the farmers may switch from grains to oil seeds, uh, sunflower, rapeseed, soya beans, which will require lower amount of nitrogen and fertilizers as a whole, and also have margins which are uh, more beneficial. So around I mean, 25 to 30% higher than the grains, uh, in particular wheat and corn. Now, indeed, we can see that this year we have several challenges and struggles for farmers and consumers ranging from geopolitics to the weather. And so how can players in the market, be they consumers or farmers, better prepare and what do you think would be the main risks for them? So, yeah, as mentioned uh, previously, basically this year, 2023, will be another very volatile year. 
not only the disruptions on the trade flow due to the war uh, adds to the scenario, but also the weather risk they're going to have in the US, uh, in the Europe, crops. Also, Ukraine and Argentina that will potentially shift towards all the crops. So we need to watch out the Russian exports. Uh, as I said, they're not free from sanctions, and we are unsure about the restriction that may limit their exports. Uh, we need to watch out the demand destruction. So this year, I would say that also the, I mean, the elephant in the room is going to be is China, right? So in a year with lower growth, are they keeping the pace of uh, imports, purchases? Talking specifically about corn in that case. Uh, so this is a very important driver for the prices this year. So what I would say is actually, I mean, the best the market participants can do, uh, farmers, uh, trading houses, industries, and buyers as a, as a whole, I mean, is to be hedged. So we cannot hedge nitrogen, we cannot hedge phosphate, but you can hedge wheat and corn. So I would suggest, I mean, working with uh, options, uh, basically in a scenario where we have lots of these money managers uh, uh, working the derivatives market, it's important to have some cushion when we place orders in order to protect yourself. So I would say that, I mean, either working with uh, buying calls, selling puts to finance these calls, or buying puts and selling calls to finance the puts, that could be a potential strategy. Or also, like the OTC tailor-made solutions, uh, which gives a cushion of improvement as well uh, in the prices. So uh, I would suggest hedge, be hedged for the, the crop ahead, and also stay tuned on hedge points news in our market reports. That's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, thanks, Iago, for all the relevant info and all the strategies that you shared with us today. I guess it will be of immense value for all the listeners today here. So I'd like to thank you for your participation. And now I'll give it back to Thais for us to continue with our 2023 webinar. Thank you all. I appreciate. I appreciate your contributions and thank you. Thank you for the points you made about the EMEA market, the European situation. Great insights, guys. Once again, thank you for being here with us. Lastly, I'd like to invite Chris, the head of U.S. Agriculture based in Chicago, to share some of his ideas with us too. And also Pedro, once again, to join us in this discussion. Thank you once again, Thais. Always a pleasure talking to Chris. Uh, so wanted to first ask Chris about uh, the crop that he has just harvested. And throughout the last year, we saw uh, U.S. production deteriorating uh, throughout the, the, the U.S. summer and uh, soybean production falling uh, below its potential and almost to a, a level of a proper crop failure on, on corn. So I wanted to ask you how have the agents dealt with that uh, and how uh, are cons not, not only farmers, which are obviously the most affected sector, but also consumers as well. Hey, Pedro. And uh, hello, Thais. And great to hear from you both. And thanks for uh Thanks for having some time today for me. Um, the 2022 U.S. crop started off uh, with high expectations. And throughout the summer, uh, particularly in the Western United States, there were some near drought conditions that really did uh, hurt the crop's yield and more importantly, harvested acre. Uh, so actually on January 12th, the USDA had their final confirmation on the, uh, the WASD numbers for acres harvested and the yield. Uh, we saw reductions on both. Uh, yield was the main headline. There were yield cuts in soybeans and corn. Um, but to me, the main surprise looking back on the spring of 22 was the harvested acres. Um, so while I wouldn't characterize the corn crop as a total failure, it was actually the fifth highest uh, production uh, ever. Um, the harvested acres for corn was actually the lowest since 2009, which was uh, a drought year. Um, that's particularly true in the West. Uh, Nebraska and Kansas um, had probably the worst showing of the United States Corn Belt relative to years past. Uh, together, it's about 17% or so uh, of the national crop. Uh, and in June, when we started doing crop conditions, good to excellent was about 60 to 70%. So solid looking crop. By the time we stopped doing crop condition reports in the fall, 
it was down to the 40 and 30 percentile. Meanwhile, the poor to very poor uh, went up in the same proportion. So all said and done, uh, U.S. corn acres abandoned uh, 2.5 million acres. Uh, on soybeans, similar story, uh, 3.8 million acres abandoned. So put that together, we lost about a billion bushels on the crop compared to estimates into the spring, most of that in the West. So what that means essentially for uh, the domestic seller and domestic buyer, basis is firmer out West. They've had two years in a row of poor crop conditions and poor production. Uh, margins have been tighter, uh, more so on corn than soybeans. So relative to the estimates for the spring, uh, corn demand, both domestic and export, was cut significantly. We lost about 500 million bushels on the U.S. corn export program relative to the spring estimates. Uh, ethanol, we lost about 300 million bushels. Uh, on the soybean side, however, we well, did have some reductions, but not as severe. We lost about 300 million bushels on the export side for soybeans. And crush was only down 100 million bushels. So um, there's more corn currently floating around the eastern United States that eventually will have to move west. Um, when that story happens, in my opinion, will be sooner than later. Um, we're going to have planting conditions uh, probably developing here in the next few months. Um, we may see a return to U.S. exports as well. U.S. exports have been very challenged with the uh, strong U.S. dollar, uh, the large crop down in South America. Uh, and then logistic issues here in the United States, those conditions are slowly unwinding. Okay, if the dollar is becoming a little weaker, uh, our exports are becoming more competitive. The Mississippi River is no longer bone dry, um, and there's still some corn sitting around the eastern United States that is currently unsold, about 25%. So short term, I expect to see uh, return to U.S. exports. I, I expect to see acres uh, for corn probably increase in response to this which I'll get to later uh, during our, our conversation. But um, that's the recap for 22, is that the Western United States had a very, very poor crop that dragged down the national average. The good crop was in the East. Um, and while the story is on yield nationally, the main issue was we had uh, a lot of acres abandoned and um, we had reduced demand to offset that to an extent. But importantly, U.S. corn, U.S. soybean stocks to use, sub 5%, and they're very, very tight to begin with. So uh, that's how I see the 2022 story. Uh, entering 23, we have uh, some headlines in geopolitics. Yeah, and when it comes to geopolitical issues and topics, we have spoke today with Thiago, Chris, and comment a bit about the scenario of Ukraine, and I'm aware that you have been following it pretty closely as well. So I wonder if you could speak a bit about how that has and likely will continue to shake markets' perception of risk and agents' decisions. If you if you can share your your thoughts with us, sure. Um, it's a great question, uh, one that uh, I'm very passionate about. Um, I'm a very uh, big fan of history. Um, it amazes me that this conflict is approaching the the one year mark. So we have uh, sort of adapted to having a normalcy of nation state on nation state modern conflict, um, along with an export program. So uh, that's something that's uh, you know quite unusual. But how I see the Ukraine story looking back and looking forward, it is truly a black swan of a black swan. The first black swan was the Russian invasion to begin with. Um, a lot of individuals, a lot of marketplace for that matter, thought that Putin actually wouldn't, quote unquote, do it. So that was the first black swan, the invasion. The other black swan, which, uh, you know, really we started to see in the days after the invasion of Ukrainian forces, not only fighting, but also winning as well. That was, you know, the true unexpected uh, lesson from the invasion. So that was lost initially, though, just the reaction of the markets. Um, but looking back on it a year later, we have uh, the conflict essentially uh, in a near stalemate. Um the Ukrainians have fought on uh, rather heroically, um, and markets have essentially sort of lulled a little bit. Uh, and by that, I mean that since the grain export corridor deal, which was signed in uh, July of 2022, um, we've had about uh, 700 or so ships that have actually exported uh, under this deal, 18.4 million metric tons. That's more or less a success story. Um, however, looking forward, though, 
as a student of history, it's my opinion that this uh, arrangement uh, simply cannot last. Um, both Putin and the Ukrainians are unsatisfied with the military conditions on the ground. Putin does not feel he has had it achieved enough to declare victory. Uh, and meanwhile, the Ukrainians feel that this is their chance to once and for all uh, fully break free of Russia. Um, the military uh, conflict is currently taking place in one part of the country, the Donbass. That's far away from the agricultural heartland of Ukraine. Um, the headlines no longer seem to concern grain traders. In my opinion, we will see at least one more uh, severe spike in the conflict and we'll see risk premium return to the Black Sea. Uh, keep in mind that this invasion started in late February of 2022. Uh, that was no accident. They had to wait for the ground to freeze over. Um, everything we've seen with Russia announcing mobilization, uh, Ukrainians receiving um, Western battle tanks. To me, this is something that there'll be at least one more big throw of the dice from either side. That will probably happen sometime between, say, March to, to May. Um, now, what this means for Ukraine for agriculture is actually quite severe. Um, corn planting will begin in April. Uh, wheat harvest will begin in July. Uh, the Ukrainian uh, Grain Council actually released an estimate for 2023. And keep in mind, this is Ukraine's uh, own numbers. So uh, they have a, they have a you know, position to try to be optimistic, remember. Um, estimate for corn production, 23, 18 million metric tons. Uh, wheat production estimate for 2023, 16 million metric tons. Total agriculture production for Ukraine this year estimated by the Ukrainians it's about 50 million metric tons together. In 2021, which was a record year, they had agriculture production of 106 million metric tons. So uh, chopped in half. What this means, a big picture in my opinion though, is that for a long time, countries um, that were consumers of commodities, I think were used to the idea that somewhere in the world, there'll be a crop available. If it's not gonna be United States, it'll be Brazil. If not Brazil, Ukraine, if not Ukraine, uh, you know, somewhere else. Um, we're really seeing one of the largest exporters in the world stage being not only uh, reduced, but in some ways there, what's happening is a generational uh, multi-year reduction in production, not even market share alone, but production. So um, I do see that the situation, although the market feels comfortable for the time being, again, front lines far away from uh, the grain producing areas, the geopolitical risk seems to be only in one part of the country. Um, this is a trend that eventually will break, in my opinion, and with that, we'll return to risk premium in the Black Sea. Yeah, indeed. And Chris, to, to finalize, uh, the questions that we have been asking everyone today, what do you think will be the key decisions and our struggles that farmers and consumers who have to face this year, and what are the risks involved in them? That's a great question, Thais. Uh, one of the items I'm most looking forward to hearing clarity on will come in June. Uh, that will come from the EPA. Um, we all know that oil share, uh, the soybean, oil, bio, diesel, renewable diesel story has been one of the main stories uh, in agriculture the last couple of years. Uh, the EPA uh, released their RVO, the renewable um, uh, obligations, in December. And while they showed an increase in renewable blending, it was not to the degree that the refining industry and the biodiesel industry expected. Um, this took soybean oil share down from 50% of crush uh, down to closer to 40% uh, as of January of the 23. Um, now, what this means is that for now, the story of soybean oil being connected to renewable diesel, uh, connected to biofuel, that story was a hot story for most of the 2022. Um, funds are currently short soybean oil in Chicago. Um, this story has sort of, uh, in some ways, uh, died on the vine. However, if you look at the actual brick and mortar operations going up, you have um, you have oil companies partnering uh, with soybean crushers to produce biodiesel plants. Uh, the amount of capacity in this country that's uh, going up every single year will continue. 
the June reports from the EPA will finalize the figures. If they finalize as is with no changes from December, I expect oil, oil share to continue to decrease. However, if there is a surprise to the upside, we will see oil share return to the near highs of 50%. And if expectations for U.S. soybean acres are correct, which is we'll have less soybean acres relative to corn, we could see an explosion and crush in this country. I think the market might be caught sideways, but that's the main thing domestically I'm looking at, which will be in June when the EPA announces the RVO numbers uh, confirming or increasing. Uh, and then, of course, uh, looking at uh, the China reopening story, um, you know, the theme that I think people are going to have to adjust to, um, which is one thing here at Hedgepoint we, we preach is knowing your operational, knowing your business margins, right? Uh, for a long time, consumers of commodities were comfortable with just buying as they needed to. Uh, if 2022 taught us anything, it's that that strategy um, has a lot of risk to it. So with China reopening, we'll see if they return to a pattern of just buying what they need or if we see a substantial import program of commodities, including, including corn and soybeans, of course, into China. Uh, both from the United States, but of course from Brazil as well. So those are the two things I'm watching in addition to the Ukraine situation, which again, coming up in the one year anniversary here uh, in a few weeks. Chris, thank you. Thank you very much for being here today with us, sharing your expertise and this overview you provide us about the American greens market and also international aspects. Really interesting. Thank you. Thank you also, Pedro, for being here with us today. Thank you both. Appreciate the questions and uh, good luck, everybody. And uh, good to see you all. Take care. Thank you, Thais. Thank you, Chris. Soybean crops still comfortable in this season 2023, but lower than expected as the U.S. was not as good as expected. As Chris highlighted, Argentina is facing problems, as Saul brought to us, and only Brazil is still on course for a record crop, as Marcelo shared. Regarding corn, the world comes from a tight crop USA and Ukraine have lower crop, and this leaves the South American crop even more in the spot. Talk about wheat, Russia and European Union tend to conquer the space left by Ukraine and Argentina, as highlighted by Iago, and this is on the supply side. When you move to the demand side, special attention to the current issues that major imports have faced and tend to continue facing through the year. So this is the this was the, the Grain Spaniel. Thank you once again for being with us. Okay, we are approaching the end of our event. I'd like to thank you all for attending our webinar today, as well as our guest speakers. We had a great time, and we hope you did too. We'd love to continue our conversation and address any points mentioned by our team today, so feel free to reach out to us by email, marketintelligence at hudpointglobal.com, or through our website. Also, do not forget to complete our site session survey, so we we'll receive the link of the recording, we just need to scan the QR code on the screen and share your opinion. Once again, we appreciate your participation. Hope to see you soon at one of our in-person RV tour events.